Will you pray with me? Come, Holy Spirit, and fill the hearts of these, your faithful, and kindle within us the fire of your love. And may my words and our hearts together glorify you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, I wonder if you would do something for me. If you were baptized as an infant, and if you feel comfortable doing so, would you raise your hand? Thank you. Now, would those of you who were baptized as a child, a teenager, or an adult, if you feel comfortable, would you raise your hand? Okay, thank you. Well, it would seem that many people here today have participated in this ritual that the church calls the sacrament of baptism. What is interesting to me is that while so many of us have participated in the sacrament of baptism, I just can't help but wonder how many of us actually know what it's all about. Because you see, I believe that it's more than fire insurance. I believe that it's more than being baptized in order to keep you out of hell. I also believe it is more than a nice sentimental thing we do when children are born. It is also more than being baptized for the repentance of sin. Note, if you will, that in today's gospel, Luke doesn't even mention the repentance word. So, what do you think it's all about? Why do we do it? Why is it important for those of us who claim the name Christian? Each of the four Gospels includes a story about the baptism of Jesus, and, and we call this ritual in the Protestant church, we call this a sacrament along with communion because these are things that Jesus actually did and commanded us to do. But there's some rather intriguing verses that were left out of today's reading. Do you see the comma in the scripture reference in your worship guide? Most of the third chapter of Luke follows the story of John the Baptist. John is the voice crying in the wilderness. John is baptizing hundreds who came out from the city of Jerusalem. John making it clear that he is not the Messiah by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming, whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This one will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The scripture goes on to say, with many other exhortations, John proclaimed the good news to the people. Well, now, I'm not so sure about you, but it just doesn't sound like good news to me, being baptized with fire, having the chaff burnt with unquenchable fire. In fact, it's rather frightening. Unless you consider that the work of Jesus was to be a refining fire. And as the wheat and chaff were thrown into the air so that the wind could separate the good seed from the chaff. That is exactly what Jesus does. Not separating out good people and bad people. Instead, with the help of the wind of the Holy Spirit, Jesus separates the best of us, of our lives and our living, and separates out that worst of us our lives and our living, and refines us with the fire of the Holy Spirit. In that case, it is good news. It's great good news, isn't it? Jesus cleaning house and making a clean sweep of our lives. So far, so good, I think. But then Luke adds a little interlude that we didn't actually hear in this morning's reading. It is about Herod being upset with John the Baptist, angry because John had charged Herod with stealing his brother's wife. In fact, Luke tells us that Herod was so upset that he shut John up in prison. That's the part that's marked by the comma in our worship guide. Then the story, as we heard it this morning, picks up. Now when all the people were baptized and when Jesus also had been baptized. Well, what are we to make of this? How could John baptize Jesus if 
John was in prison. Perhaps Luke is writing about something that had already happened before Herod imprisoned John, or maybe this is Luke's way of saying that Jesus' baptism does not necessarily make him special, but makes him one with us, just like us, standing in line with all the other people, waiting to receive the gift of baptism. Or, as Harry went, said, this is Jesus, the one who became the Messiah, the Christ, the King who does feet. If you look carefully, you will discover that not only did Luke leave out any discussion about repentance of sin, but also any words about Jesus' actual baptism. There is no description of Jesus going down into the water or coming up out of the water. We assume that that's what happened because the other Gospels tell us about it. But Luke doesn't seem to even care. In fact, Luke doesn't seem very interested in the actual moment of baptism at all. Only what happens after the baptism. You see, Luke seems much more interested in what happens with Jesus after the water had dried. Luke is interested in telling the story of this Jesus who lived a crazy love-shaped life. And there are clues throughout Luke's gospel of this way of living a crazy love-shaped life, running like a river through this gospel, even though Luke doesn't say anything about a river, much less Jesus being in it. And we see it first right after Jesus is baptized. You see, the story, according to Luke, says that Jesus was praying. You see, it is while he was praying, not while he was being baptized, that the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, shifting the epiphany, the inbreaking of God into his life from an act of baptism to the act of prayer. Throughout Luke's gospel, Jesus is praying. Jesus prays before he calls his disciples before asking them, who do you say that I am? Jesus prays before the time of his transfiguration, before teaching his disciples how to pray. Jesus prays on the night of his arrest and prays at his death. And Luke says, pray. Pray whether you believe in infant baptism or believer's baptism. Whether you believe baptism is a visible sign of God's commitment to you or your commitment to God. Pray whether you believe in sprinkling or immersion. Pray. Frankly, Luke doesn't seem interested in such debates that have tangled us up for years, but is very interested in life after baptism. Then, after the Holy Spirit descended, a voice came from heaven saying, You are my son, my beloved. With you I am well pleased. Jesus was praying, centering his life in the presence of God in a very intentional way. And it was then that he heard the voice from heaven. And perhaps if we did the same, we might hear the same. This Affirmation is the defining moment of Jesus' life. God's declaration of God's crazy love for Jesus and an anointing of Jesus with these words, a call to enter that crazy love for all humanity. It is God calling Jesus' name, and there may be nothing more important to any one of us than to know that God knows our name and calls us by name. We live in a world and a culture that more and more regards us as whatever assigned number we've been given. 
But this story of Jesus' baptism reminds us that God doesn't substitute numbers for names. In our Hebrew lesson this morning, we hear the truth proclaimed in the words of the prophet Isaiah, I have called you by name, you are mine. Moreover, in these words, God makes a promise to you and to me that when we pass through the waters, God will be with us and we will not be overwhelmed. God has created us, you and me. God has created us for God's glory in the image and likeness of God. We have been created, and in baptism we participate in that reality. Baptism is about identity, and names are the first means by which we are set apart. This understanding of baptism actually has been lost in an age when sonograms tell parents the sex of their child weeks prior to birth. By the time a child is brought to the church to be baptized, the name is familiar to everybody, family and friends alike. Still, in the sacrament of baptism, we refer to the one being baptized as this child. Then comes that moment when the pastor, on behalf of the church, takes that child into his or her arms and asks, what name is given this child? And the parents respond with their chosen name, or the adult being baptized speaks their given name. Only afterward, only after that moment of naming, does our liturgy Name the child. The child of God, set apart for God, made in the image of God, bestowed with the promises and belovedness of God. Of course, these promises come with great responsibility. It is like the responsibility of living into your given and family name. Your given name or names makes you special, defining your uniqueness. The family name tells you that you are part of something greater than yourself. You are part of a family and a heritage. In Africa, as with many other cultures, ancestor veneration is, deeply spirit, is a deeply spiritual acknowledgement of this accountability. People are concerned with not offending the integrity of the old ones, the names of those who have gone before them. I got a taste of that responsibility when I first went to college. At the beginning of my second semester, I participated in social sorority selection process called Rush. At the end of that week, having been invited to join the one sorority I had held out all my hopes on, I called my mom filled with excitement when I told her that I was now an Alpha Delta Pi, she said to me, Joe Gale, I want you to remember something. First, you are a Christian. Then, you are a Hudson. Then, you are a student at North Texas State University. Finally, and only finally, are you an Alpha Delta Pi. Great responsibility and accountability. So it is that our names call us to accountability. And what greater accountability can there be than to know that we are called by God, named and claimed for God's glory? In fact, baptism, the sacrament of baptism, sets us apart as a particular kind of person. Not perfect, but loved and named and claimed by a love praised God. And you and I are called to live out the meaning of that remarkable reality. In baptism, we proclaim and celebrate that we belong to God and that we participate in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, whom we call Christ. And that we continue to live into a crazy love kind of life, 
through the work of the Holy Spirit at work in us and through us. You see, throughout our lives, multiple forces will attempt to redefine us after we have left the baptismal font and the water has dried. Some will attempt to convince us that we are owned by a great economic machine for the purpose to make us voracious consumers. Other voices will tell us that we belong to no one but ourselves and that individualism is the supreme God. Events and circumstances in our lives will break our hearts and disappoint us. And rejection and heartache will try to define us. But the imprint of baptism transcends all of this because we who are loved and named and claimed by God know that our primary identity is not as cogs in an economic machine. We know that we cannot thrive on our own strength alone. We know that whatever heartache or hurt or challenge in our life does not define us, that our primary identity is that we belong to God to a loved, crazed God who has blessed us. But mark this. Mark this. Our baptism doesn't end at the baptismal font. It begins there, just as it did for Jesus. And if that is the case, which I believe it is, our best life is always before us. As children of God, created and named and claimed by God, we have a chance to always be living into our baptism, always embracing that reality, always embracing our faith in God, our Creator, our Christ, and the Holy Spirit. We have a chance to be people of prayer so that God's life breaks into our lives and we hear the affirmation that we belong to God. Fire, wind, and water blessing and belovedness. Life, life is utterly and completely mysterious, and yet, here in this unknown, here in the midst of anything that might make us afraid, we get to know that God is near us, just as God was near to Jesus at his baptism, with so much still ahead of him, as he moved through it all, he knew that he was God's beloved child. In fact, I believe those words rang in his ears throughout his life, calling him to do the great work of loving humanity. And you see, baptism ends too soon when we focus only on that moment and forget what comes after the water has dried. What comes after is a crazy, love-shaped life where God's Spirit dwells with us and within us, calling us forth to our best life each day, each moment, each heartbeat, each breath, filled with the love, the crazy love of God. You see, God hasn't given us just a little bit of something. God has given us the best. God's own self. God's own life revealed to us in Jesus Christ, a love at work in you and me. And we can embrace that reality and live into that affirmation, you are my child, my beloved, or we can just float downstream. What would you do if you knew that you couldn't fail because of God's beloved blessing on you. What are you doing right now in your beloved, blessed life that requires your faith? What are you doing right now in your beloved, blessed life that is a reflection of the crazy love that God pours into you? What does baptism mean? Lots of things. But most of all, it means that you are good. You are loved. 
you are blessed. My friends, at baptism, God named you and claimed you and called you God's own and has promised to be with you so that you will not be overwhelmed. And I don't want you to forget that truth. I don't want you to forget that reality ever. I, in fact, want you to remember your baptism and give thanks every time you wash your hands and wash your body and every time you take a sip of water that is life for us. I want you to remember, and every single time, I want you to say to yourself, I am God's beloved child, named and claimed and called forth to be God's crazy love at work in the world. That is my best life. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Amen.